Hi, this is Paula Martins at the 12th Annual Military History Fest. Welcome to Military History Fest! standing here in this fabulous World War II base camp with John Flagel. John, could you please tell us a bit about your fabulous display here? This is great. Sure. I love it. Thank you. Uh, what we're depicting here, we're 5th Armored Division, and what we're depicting here is our what would be our armored base camp. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, kind of going around the room here, this first area set up over here is where we would do some small weapons repair and a lot of cleaning. Uh, but we do have weapons break when we're at events, so we, we do have to occasionally make some repairs. The uh, t time period we're looking at here is, is this a World War II, 1942-1945 in Europe, mm -hmm. primarily. This area over here is where we would uh, cook our meals. Uh, we do try to keep consistent with... Uh, World War II mess. You can see there's a couple of World War II cookbooks on. And the I noticed there. all the cans of spam. spam. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we're we're fond of spam. We eat a lot of spam. Uh, this is an immersion heater. A lot of people ask us about that. Uh, there's a gasoline container on the top that drips into a donut ring at the bottom that uh, heats water, and we use that to wash our dishes with, uh, clean up some. On this side over here. Uh, is a radio repair area. Uh, we usually don't do radio repairs in the field because the equipment's kind of sensitive, but since we're indoors this time, uh, we're able to make some repairs. So what Jesse's trying to do there is a radio set uh, transmitter and a couple receivers out of one of our half tracks. Uh, he's trying to see if he can get that running for us. So we're fortunate that we do have somebody that is... Uh, an actual radio repairman, and this familiar with uh, per, uh, period equipment help keep it running for us. I'm here with Dave Fornell of the 353rd Infantry Unit. Now, Dave, you've got a really great display as always, so would you uh, mind telling us all about this? Sure. Well, the uh, representation that we have here is a uh, French tank uh, from uh, early 1918. It's an FT-17 tank and uh, these tanks were the most numerous uh, and our display is geared towards celebrating the 100th anniversary of tank warfare uh, 1916 to 2016. So the uh, display that you see behind us is a uh, barn. It's uh, from the 1850s that was uh, torn down during a demolition project that we saved the panels from and reconstructed uh, one half of the barn. And then the tank itself is a uh, uh, FT-17 tank. The French built this. Uh, it was a revolutionary design at the time. 
uh, where it had large front wheels that could go over obstacles and uh, shallow trenches. It also had a rotating turret. It was the first tank to use a rotating turret. They were either mounted with a Hotchkiss machine gun or with a 37mm cannon. In this case, it's the short barrel 37mm cannon, which was designed to not take out other tanks, but it was designed to take out machine gun nests. This tank was built uh, within a one month time span with uh, people from our reenacting unit. Uh, everything that you see here is uh, built to the original specs in terms of uh, measurements. And the tank is not operational yet, but it does roll on its tracks. And we're hoping to have it motorized within the next six months. This is also a prototype tank. The uh, engineering that we had to work out on this uh, was to solve some problems so when we build a steel version of this tank, uh, the steel version will work very well. So the FT-17 uh, was a two-man crew. It had uh, a gunner and also a commander that could stand up in the tank and his head actually went into a little cupola that's on the top of the turret that had slits that he could look out of. And the driver sat in the front nose of the tank. The Rear of the tank had a uh, hatch for the driver to get in and out of that you see here, and it had a 37 millimeter gun breech that you see. The inside of this uh, should be lined with 37 millimeter uh, cannon shells. And then the driver sat in the front position. On the back, we have a toolbox that we put together, then they have various equipment such as the tow chains to get it out of the mud and uh, buckets. The symbolism on the tank, uh, which is the uh, card sign here for the uh, cloves, this is, they use card symbols because everybody is familiar with cards and playing cards. So they would use uh, hearts or diamonds or spades, uh, cloves to uh, denote which uh, battalion or regiment that you were from. So this is the driver's position for the FT-17. The, uh, the hatches will open up and uh, you have to open up the driver's visor. And when you flip this back, it exposes the driver's position. The spring on the front is meant to lock it in place in an open position so you didn't uh, break your fingers and you can get it in and out pretty easily. You notice that they have two drive levers. The levers were actually brakes. So as you drove the vehicle uh, with pedals in the front to uh, accelerate and to clutch, uh, it had two separate transmissions, uh, one for each track. The large levers are how you steered. You would uh, pull one back to brake it, uh, and if you brake uh, the left track, it'll turn left while the other one's still turning. Uh, if you want to uh, come to a full stop, you pull both of these levers back at once. The uh, tank was also equipped with chains inside to lock these in a back position, so you could basically use it as a parking brake. You can see the driver's seat is a pad on the floor, and then there's a pad that stretches across the back with uh, three quick-release straps in case he had to bail out the rear hatch or in case he was trying to give aid or he needed aid himself. Uh, the other tank crew member could uh, give first aid. Um, we do take donations, and we're trying to raise money right now to build full steel versions of this uh, tank to take out to uh, reenactments. Uh, we have an uh, annual event that we're building this for at Midway Village, and uh, that is the second weekend of April every year. And uh, the website for Midway Village is www.midwayvillage.com. Now I am standing in the 1961 Family Fallout Shelter with Dr. Melissa Lincheski or Professor Lincheski. Yes. Uh, Professor Lincheski here is a contaminant hydrogeologist for real. So, Dr. Lincheski, if you could tell us about this wonderful fallout shelter that you and uh, Ms. Marie have made. So, yeah, so this is a representation of the 1961 to 63 fallout shelter. So during this time period, it's right after the Berlin crisis. Kennedy is talking about the Berlin Wall, and we've also got the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. So during this time, we're very terrified of this of a World War III coming out. 92% of Americans really were much rather die from a nuclear bomb than become communist. And so there was this really big movement movement in this country to really do anything in order to stop the communist movement. So we were told that duck and cover. If the bombs were going to go off, you should duck, cover, and hide yourself. Well, one of the things that they would do is a lot of families wanted to protect themselves. And so they would build these fallout shelters. The fallout shelter was designed in order to be able to you to survive in here for two full weeks um, with all of your supplies and rations. So the uh, civil defense would um, give you, um, Office of Civil Defense would supply you with sanitation kits, helmets, Geiger counters, um, emergency water that was in cans, toilet paper, because you would have a sanitation. You had to go to the bathroom. You're supposed to live in here for two full weeks. So you would have these cans where you would, it would basically be a chemical toilet in this space. 
you would have an air circulator in here because your air had to be recirculated around so you would put these air circulators in here your food you would be coming up with different types of food that could be used over the two weeks that didn't really need a lot of heating or preparation that you could stand they did have these emergency biscuits that they um, you could also purchase from the civil defense and they had all the nutrients that you needed in order to survive uh, for two weeks in here so a lot of families would build these in their backyards uh, they didn't want their neighbors to know about it because if their neighbors knew they were building them what happens if those sirens would go off who gets in you you only have enough supplies in here for your family of four and so you would actually have firearms in here in order to protect yourself from the russians but also from your neighbors and so a lot of times people would build these in secret could you also tell us about how in a sense, the bad science, that people built these really thinking that they would survive a nuclear, nuclear bomb and there would be no way they could in this. Yeah, one of the things that they would try to do is they, they had these, the walls, they had a protection factor and they would publish how much protection you would get from the bombs. Well, they kept saying, oh, it doesn't need to be that thick. You know, oh, if there's fallout, you know, if you just have a uh, concrete, you'll be fine. And they would publish this. And so people um, and a lot of charlatans, too, people would say, oh, I'll build you a really great bomb shelter. It will protect you. And no, the science wasn't there. Um, these walls would not have protected you from nuclear fallout. Uh, they would radiation could get in very easily into here. Um, you were supposed to have your door in the back and supposed to make a right angle so the air couldn't get in here, but they, they leaked. There would be groundwater in here. They just, the science was awful. Um, we really did not understand fully the American public what it really meant to be protected from this. Um, if this, if a nuclear bomb went off, say in Chicago, these things would never have protected us. Um, the city of Chicago actually had it set up so they were just going to do evacuations. They put in very few fallout shelters within the city of Chicago. And so most of their stuff was all on, oh, we'll just evacuate the city. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Not gonna happen, <laughs> yeah, not going to so. happen. Well, thank you so much then for giving us a tour of your wonderful fallout shelter. I was told that uh, maybe in an hour or so we were going to have a 1950s, 1960s dance party in oh, here. Oh, yeah. Okay, I will be back yeah, for that. Yes. I, I'll bring some records. Oh, okay. So, yay. all right. Thank you, ladies. No thank problem. you, Professor. No problem. It was a pleasure. So, we will be back. Okay, bye. Good uh, afternoon. I guess it's still afternoon here. My name is Aaron Rowland, and I am a living historian with the 36th Illinois Infantry out of Joliet and surrounding counties. Today, we're here at Military History Fest. We are portraying soldiers in the Nashville Winter Quarters in the winter of 1864 into 1865. Looking around here, you can see some of the items that the soldiers would have had. So we have our winter shelter here, simply consists of four walls and a door, atop by our, um, uh, well, top by our A-frame wedge tents. Now inside, we actually have a wood-burning stove. We've got, uh, well, we've got some of the personal equipment that the soldiers would have had. So, for instance, we've got our toothbrush, we've got some of our toiletries, we have lanterns, we have uh, stationery, we have Bibles. Of course, we also have our standard issue equipment, so our blankets, our knapsacks, haversacks, and our rifles. So this is very similar to what soldiers would have lived in in the winter of 1864 and 1865. Now, as we, as we pan out a little bit, you can get a better view of the camp. Now, of course, areas like this would have become moonscapes rather quickly as these soldiers began to utilize and often overutilize some of the, the resources that they had available to them. So, of course, soldiers would spend a lot of time um, lounging around in camp. So we also have, our, we have some of our eating supplies, our eating utensils, we have chairs and we have tables so we also have some of our equipment out on display over here as well we have well we have our canteens here ammunition boxes for our weapons soldiers never had a real need for ammunition especially in winter quarters so that about does it for the 36th illinois and thank you for spending your afternoon with us Hello, I'm sitting here outside the Royal Air Force bunker and things are getting a bit intense here with a game of chess with Mr. Chip Berger. Hi Chip. Good day. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. 
And are you um, okay with me beating you in chess? Um, no, because it's actually checkers. Oh, checkers. <laughs> oh, I should have known better because of the pieces. These are like the little things. Well, you know what? The board still looks the same. So I'd rather have you beat me in chess than checkers. Okay. Well, I'm going to beat Chip in checkers. That's a tongue twister. So, so you have built this this really great Royal Air Force World War II bunker. And um, I would like you to take us inside so you can give us the grand tour. Sure. And then I'll come and kick your behind in checkers. So what you see behind you is a, a replica uh, and a downsize, you know, downscale version of a replica of a dispersal hut. Uh, dispersal huts were built uh, by the RAF uh, before and during the Battle of Britain, which was the summer of 1940. So really the burn of it from July to uh, September of 1940. And the, uh, the thought was to spread the squadrons out as broadly as possible in order to have them in a position uh, where the right type of planes, the right number of planes intercept a German raid coming in based on the location, size of the formation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you'd have the pilots waiting on the ground, the planes waiting on the ground, uh, rather than circling aimlessly, wasting fuel, waiting for the, uh, the enemy to appear. So this is outside uh, on a nice day. I mean, it, it is a summer, 1940. Between flights, they're resting, they're killing time, waiting for you know the order to uh, to go aloft. And so you would see uh, them just like this. They'd be relaxing in deck chairs, their their kit ready to grab and run and take to the plane with them. Um, usually, they would already have their life vests on just to save time, and they would just basically wait here until the call. All right. Well, how about we go inside and right. take a look around? Excellent. Let's go. Oh, by the way, you could probably... Oh, you know. gotcha. Oh, well, uh, I took one of yours, so... You did? <laughs> okay. All sure. All right. Oh, look, we can sit here and ring Chip's bell. That was loud. All right, here we are inside the bunker. Oh, and all these pretty ladies and dartboard. A little bit of the comforts of home. Um, obviously, inclement weather. You come inside, get sheltered out of the elements. Nice pot belly stove uh, inside the dispersal hut. Uh, put on a pot of tea. Grab a bite during the day, etc. In between uh, missions. Um, and again, some of these fighter pilots during the really bad days of the battle, but they would be up and down, up and down aloft multiple times during the day, it was exhausting. And doing that day after day after day, having you know death stare you in the face uh, in the form of uh, all sorts of Luftwaffe planes. So what you see in here are either uh, original artifacts or replicas of things that would, would have been found in a, in a, uh, a squadron hut or a, a, a duty hut. Uh, probably the most, one of the most important things is uh, communications to group. So you have communications lines running off uh, to all the dispersal huts for them to get their orders. Um, in the southeast part of England, they had a actually two networks of radar. This is really the first modern strategic use or tactical use of radar, uh, all tied together in a telecommunications network to like a nerve center where they could figure out is this an important raid or just a, is this a faint, is it a diversion, where are they coming in, how many planes went out to do it, etc. In addition to that, since this is all day fighting, they would have Royal Observer Corps. So they had folks with you know transits and bullet binoculars uh, spotting the, the flights coming in and being able to figure out what altitude they're at, relative order of, of how many planes are going in. And so they were able to scramble the right amount of planes to a right point in the sky and give them, you know, fly towards this vector, vector toward this altitude, this heading, etc. And you should be able to intercept the raid coming in. So they would get the call and they would let everybody know it was scramble time. So they would, whoever got the phone call, as soon as they got the order to go, would come run around the corner and uh, which makes yourself heard on an airfield over Merlin engines and all that. Oh, I can imagine. And so at that point you would see anyone who was on squadron on duty that day would just scramble uh, to their planes. They would run at a dead sprint to get in their planes. They, they had moments to get aloft and get up to altitude and intercept the German raid coming in. So you'd have up kind of your operations desk here, communications, paperwork to fill out. 
the Royal Air Force, like the Army, runs on paperwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. What you also see here in a the corner, these, these, are, these are training aids, these are learning aids. These are silhouettes of German aircraft of the time. It's for recognition, enemy recognition, because you have a, a split second to figure out do I shoot, do I not, is it friendly, is it foe, especially with you know, hundreds of planes filling the skies like you did in uh, the summer of 1940. And uh, so in addition to the, the silhouettes for recognition, they also built models. Mm -hmm. So you could figure out, you know, is that a Spitfire, is it a Hurricane, or is it a German plane? Because mm -hmm. again, these would just be like dots on the horizon. You'd, you'd have to literally make a split-second decision as to how to attack, mm -hmm. and when to fire, and whether or not to fire in the first place. So radio would keep us uh, in touch with the rest of the world. But in those dispersal huts, you would see guys, gear half on, half off, um, ready to go in Look at chairs, sometimes just snoozing because these guys are exhausted and they hear the bell and dead sprint out to the uh, out to the aircraft. Hello and welcome to the city of Accra circa 1191. We're standing before a market stall in the city of Accra where any manner of home goods you would want are available for purchase or holy relics because you want to bring home holy relics when you're on crusade. Or you may stop by the military order recruiting booth if you wish to join in the glorious crusade to retake the city of Jerusalem. Remember, it's for God and the Holy Land. We're here with Rome, Chicago. This is our encampment. We do approximately a 43 BC uh, mid-Republican group. Um, we have one of our tents here um, and equipment is kind of scattered about. Uh, this is what it would have looked like at the end of the evening for a Roman encampment. We have a torsion ballista here which was copied from the ancient Greeks. Um, it was used to launch arrows two to three hundred yards. Um, it was a very effective weapon against mounted cavalry and groups of massed infantry um, and uh, boy um, it was small enough that it could be broken up and carried by pack animals uh, it comes apart in pieces um, in smaller pieces so that uh, it can be moved these spiky things down here are sude stakes um, every warrior would have carried two of those uh, they were used at night to build an encampment. They were a defensive thing. Uh, you could tie them together, or if you had a palisade built, you could stick them into the palisade, and they would stick out and create a pointed thing that people just wouldn't want to run up against. Um, we have various bits of equipment, helmets and swords. Um, the helmets are... Uh, Mondefortinos and or uh, Gallic, early Gallic helmets. Most of the helmets were copied from the Gauls and uh, the Celtic tribes that the Romans had conquered. Um, the Romans acquired a lot of equipment from groups that they had conquered or overtaken. Uh, if they found it to be good and worthy of their use or better than what they were using, this is what they would use. Three, three, four, five. Okay. Longest five seconds I've ever spent. Because I am here with what Chris Olson. Yes. Is your name, and this and is your uh, photography studio, mm -hmm. which is uh, using a replica, or is this an original? Oh, this is a replica with a, an original lens. Right. Um, of an 1860s Anthony style. That's the company that made this style camera. Um, up until Polaroid, this was the fastest process. You could say that you wanted a picture get the picture in as little as five minutes. And a Polaroid is still a couple of minutes for developing, even even the modern ones. Um, it could be done on glass or metal, positives or negatives. So if you wanted to make many different pictures, it would be a slightly longer exposure, you'd have to sit there longer, and it would be on glass. But I could make as many pictures as you would like from that negative. I could also do this on glass show you. Step around. All right. Take that, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
one of the nice things about this process and that makes it particularly unique is that you can have a negative image a negative image but then and it becomes a positive it becomes image. positive when you put a uh, black background on it and that's the, that's the same same principle as with the tint types except it's on black lacquered metal instead of instead of glass so we have a subject here mm -hmm. to be photographed and you have this blue light could you please explain to us about the blue light All right so the blue end of the spectrum is what this is this process is more susceptible to it's more sensitive to the blue light so while the white light does a good job I just want it'll add a little bit of speed and also a little bit of depth um, by having the blue lights so Louise is going to focus them in While she's doing that, I'm going to disappear and I'm going to put the plate into the plate holder. That way he doesn't have to stand under the lights forever. Yes. Okay, are we ready? Yes, we are. Okay, All right. Just go ahead, Weezy. All right, so we've put the now light-sensitive plate into the plate holder, and she's focused him in. Focused him in. Okay, so now she's going to cover up the lens, for a long six seconds. and it's going to be a six-second long exposure. So she covers the lens with her hand, removes the dark slide, and she'll remove her hand and make the exposure. Ready? Here we go. One. Now I'm going to take it and I'll develop it. So it's done very much the same way as um, pouring the collodion onto it, just with developer. And then I keep an eye on the image and when it's finished, I will put it in water, rinse it off. We fix it, that brings the image all the way out. And, voila. and then voila. It's so it's been in the rinse water now for about 10, 15 minutes. Now. The whites on these plates, these whites, mm -hmm. are metallic silver, so they'll tarnish. Now one thing you'll notice as the plate dries is that it will lighten up substantially mm -hmm. and it'll darken up again when I put the varnish on. During reenactments I do this over a flame. The hot plate is nice. I can do multiple ones. There it goes. Now is also a time where I start doing a little bit of diagnosis on what might be going on with my chemistry in general. For example, if the blacks were kind of frosty, looked like they had a film over it, that means that my developer is too active. So I might add a pinch of sugar to it to help restrain it or just add a little bit of water. There's always one little spot that takes forever. But this hot plate makes it a little bit too hot to varnish, so I'll pull it off for the rest. Now we're starting. See the contrast is raised a little bit. It's nice and shiny. We just have to wait a couple of minutes for the varnish to dry and we can hand it off to them. Ah, oh, yes, I have an Instagram, which is Dagnabbit Studio on Instagram.
We are here with the 353 Infantry Regiment, a German group, uh, portraying 1914 France, uh, where we have taken refuge in this bombed out farmhouse. Uh, and the doctor is uh, attending to patients and has left us here to wrap bandages and uh, uh, kind of mind the fort for him. Uh, my name is Jennifer and this is my weird hobby. And this is my friend Heather who is here at the Verbandplatz, which is the bandaging station. <laughs> and thank you, Jennifer. I am also with the 353rd. I am currently making bandages as we tear off pieces and roll them up. Uh, most nurses didn't serve on the main line, um, and specifically auxiliary volunteer nurses, which is what we are portraying in the striped uniforms. So we would have been quite a bit back. I think what has happened in this situation is that the line found us. So we were probably in the rear echelon and uh, the situation became less static and we are now uh, in the throes of it here on the front line. We are doomed. doomed. <laughs> Auxiliary nurses um, had about six months of training compared to full nurses who had over a year in the German Red Cross. Um, so basically they were like what we would call today nursing assistants or nurses aides, um, folding bandages, cleaning bedpans. They wouldn't have done a lot of uh, really technical medical stuff because they didn't have the training. Sterilizing instruments um, and you know basic care for patients, shaving them, keeping them clean and entertained. Hi, I'm here with Ken Bauman, who is a collector, and he brought his pieces of his fabulous collection to come and show us. So, Ken, could you please tell us about what you have here? Okay, well, I have two uh, Civil War cannons, both of them built in 1861. The biggest one is a, a three-inch ordnance rifle, and here is a collection of original Civil War projectiles that were picked up on battlefields, and it's the proper ammunition for that gun. The littler gun is inch and a half diameter, also rifled. There's a reproduction cartridge for it. And it was the first breech loading cannon adopted by the US service, mainly because it was invented by a congressman and he had Lincoln's ear. And Lincoln bought 20 of them. The army wasn't really interested and they got shuffled off to a backwater. and. It they were used very, very uh, sparingly during the war. The, the big gun was, was pretty much the main state-of-the-art field artillery piece of the, of the North. Made out of wrought iron rather than cast iron, it's stronger. Had a range of a couple of miles and uh, included with it is the prime mover. This is called a limber. On the other end of this would be a pole and six horses. And ammunition was carried in here. And for the little gun, there's a smaller limber over there, which only had two horses. Very nice. Well, thank you so much for showing us your, your uh, collector pieces and your display. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Hi. Hello. Who are you? I am a Viking. You're a Viking? Or, now, are you with a specific group here? Yeah, I'm with the Vikings North America. Okay, but what, what's your group? I mean, where are you guys from? Uh, we're uh, all over the uh, Vinland, North America. Okay, no, what I mean is, you know, your, your uh, history group, your reenactment group. I, I saw you oh, looking yeah. at some bonnets that, that here. That is what I am saying. That is, uh, we are from the Vikings North America. Okay, but your group, you, you like, what do, what do you do in the real world? You know, like in real life. I pillage and raid and row on the boat. Really? Wow. Does, yeah. does that pay well? Uh, as much as you can take, yeah, as much as you can carry. Okay, so, so you're like a real Viking is what you're trying to tell me. Well, I've never met a real Viking before. Well, I, mostly I farm, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so what did you see here at the Military History Fest that you liked? They, they have very strange helmets okay. and very strange clothing for the ladies. What did you think of the ladies while you were here? Uh, well, they look strong, you know, they could do uh, work, churning the butter and such. Did you find any of them pretty? 
Uh, not as pretty as the Danish women, but... Uh, I mean, none of the fine women here at Military History Fest you wanted to throw over your shoulder and carry off with you? Well, they would get a good price. It had to be, you know. Okay. Well, well, well did you enjoy yourself this weekend? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried uh, the American food that you have here, the, uh, the hot dog. It's not very good, is it? Uh, it's okay. I mean, you know, it beats the uh, dried meat, you know, kept up in the rafters. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess it would. So, well, I'm, we're glad that you came like, out to the fest. I like the bun. All this, the buns, the yes. The bun bread, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's much better than the flat bread we have in Denmark. Oh, I can imagine so. Well, thank you for coming to the Military History Fest and bring your other cute Viking friends next year. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tak Standing here in the USO World War II canteen here at the Pheasant Run Resort. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Are you enjoying yourself today at the at the USO canteen here yes, at the Pheasant Run? Anytime there's free food. Oh, of course, definitely. I think we might have to partake in some of this ourselves. Let's see, they've got a wide variety of different 1940s popular food items. Uh, they have a little spam sandwiches. Egg salad, chicken salad. Oh, I need the chicken salad. Bacon and tomato with a wide variety of different desserts and dishes of, oh, key lime pie, coconut custard. And me being a, a Southern belle from Nashville, they've got pecan pie, so I think I'm gonna hang out here for a while. You are all dressed up here at the USO Canteen. So could you tell us about uh, the canteen here, your group, and what the USO Canteens did during World War II? We are the Chicagoland Customers Guild, located here in the Chicago suburbs, Chicagoland and suburbs. And all the food that we have here is food that would have been available during your World War uh, II years. Uh, from uh, cream chip beef on toast in some circles was known as SOS. I won't, because this is a family show, I won't say what SOS is. Um, we have macaroni and tomato sauce, which was a staple back then. On our sandwiches, the infamous Spam sandwich. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> I, I pointed those out first thing, the Spam sandwiches. And all of our pastries here are made according to a ration uh, oh, nice. Sugar ration. So instead of using an entire cup of sugar, you might have used only a quarter cup of sugar and filled in the difference with either honey, uh, molasses, maple syrup, and possibly corn syrup. I think I'm going to have to test one of your brownies here. Let's see. Mm, very good. Uh, we will be giving a lecture at 1 o'clock on what it took to be a USO girl, on rationing and how various farms and mm -hmm. communities took care of their uh, people away from home, and how some of the farmers down south had to make do with whatever they had because everything else got shipped out to the troops. Yes, well that sounds like a very interesting lecture and one that many people would enjoy listening to. Now, did, what, what did you make here? And, and tell me, how is it to cook with the recipes using the rationing? Um, it takes a little getting used to because you always want to just add the sugar, add the eggs, mix mm -hmm. it all up. You, uh, with, I, have, I actually have a book that was handed down to me from my mom that has 300 sugar-saving recipes and uh, by a lady, excuse me, by a lady named Harriet H. Hester of 300 sugar saving recipes and it was produced in 1942 uh, in accordance with WLS radio station who helped produce the book. And there is uh, any number of recipes, you might still be able to find the book online or uh, wherever you think you might be able to look it up. I have a, an original book that was uh, produced called Eating for Victory. And uh, it gives a lot of the different recipes to use during rationing. And I have not cooked anything out of it yet. So now, now with the, like the sugar, you know, the using less sugar and things, do you find this stuff, I mean, 
it's like think of our diet today is so saturated in sugar and this sounds like just salts and sugar yeah that this seems that you can still because you don't uh, if you're not using high fructose corn syrup there's no MSG so everything that you made was fresh it needed to be refrigerated it's not something you could just put on a shelf and forget about it for a few days because it would go bad and you didn't want to waste it of course yeah and it's with this being just absolutely delicious items uh, yeah why not with the exception of the canned whipped cream yes (laughs) but uh, Uh, yeah I see that there (laughs) So, well, thank you so much for um, telling us about this this fabulous exhibit. Hi, I'm here with Grant Kohler. Hi, Grant. How are you doing today? Doing all right. How about yourself? I am doing great. Um, why don't you give us a tour here of your your uh, your exhibit here in the in the display hall? So absolutely. Now, what we have here is about uh, it is about April May of 1805 on the Port of Belong on the English uh, French English Channel coast. Okay. At this time, Napoleon was just months away, crowned emperor of the French. And ever since the middle of 1804, he's been getting his forces ready to invade England, since it was the only nation at the time that really became an obsession of wanting to try to get out of the war game. I mean, because he beat the Austrians, he beat the Egyptians, he beat the Austrians again, and brought peace. But Britain was always the thorn on the side. And... By about this time, he was assembling at least 200,000 soldiers ready to invade England, but had 74 English, uh, Br- French and Spanish warships sailing from Spain mm-hmm. under the command of Monsieur de Villeneuve. But he, he proved that the squadrons were too ill-prepared to face uh, Admiral Horatio Nelson at the time. That was one of the factors that made it so he was unable to invade. And it didn't help that the English and had persuaded both the Russians and the Austrians to attack the French from the east. Thus led to the Austerlitz campaign and all the other battles that came before it. So why don't you show us what you have here in your your camp? All right. Now most of us, uh, most of the regiments here we would have issued the 1777 uh, Pattern 9 Charleville Musket. It was a smooth bore musket if anything. Napoleon, he uh, tr- he tried to stick with, use the old weapons, but use new tactics because he tried to do uh, divide and conquer, where it was like you would hit the enemy and try to split it up and divide, defeat him in detail. But as far as the whole army, uh, like myself, I am a regiment of Leger, where I was able to be issued uh, either the Charleville musket or if we were able to at the time able to have a French carbine musket which would actually come up to about uh, say about there on me and that was helpful for us as because as Legers or the light regiment we would have to be the skirmishers of the battalion so it's like the snipers before and this is the very first uh, Napoleonics were very the sort of the pioneers of skirmishers at the time because you always see like uh, rangers and stuff like that but they weren't really skirmishers per se or at least belong to a unit this point we were actually and as far as the six at least for the way I'm working wearing is a voltageur in other words the skirmisher of that company of the six legers first battalion and indications of this would actually be if I could take my pop bicorn hat. Uh, one good indication, if you're going from top to bottom, is the yellow pom-pom, which was also a good insignia, uh, uh, significant, I yes, significant uh, signal that this was a voltageur. Another way to figure out was look at the jacket, that the green and yellow epaulets, as well as the yellow collar with red trim depending on the regiment you are a part of. And it would all be a dark blue uh, jacket instead of a, you have the white facings as you would see with uh, the line regiments. And the only difference is, is that I didn't have it with me yet, is that we would have the same dark blue vest, uh, knee breechers, and below the knee gaiters. Now, 
every French, every almost every French regiment had gators, but the legers were a bit different. The the way this works was that they were even though they were below the knee gators, they had to be a little more decorative. I say that because at about right about there on the knee breachers, you would have uh, uh, trim such like this as yellow, especially for the voltageurs. You would have yellow trim and a tesset hanging down from the front, at least by about a few inches. But that's if uh, we wanted to go into parade or if we had, if, like I said, if we were able to have it on us, because these campaigns lasted for a good 20 years and you probably didn't end up with what you started out with at the end. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, will you come in the fashion show? Oh, come on, Grant. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. Come on, you just look absolutely wonderful in your very French ensemble here. You have to show it off. You, The French people, you could never not be, like, dressed up. You know? I'm, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. Well, hmm. hopefully we'll be seeing Grant in the fashion show later on today. Yeah, later not, uh, Yakov Davidovich Ugolev. For you Americans, I'm saying that I am Lieutenant uh, Jacob Ugolev of the Soviet Army, or the Red Army of Workers and Peasants. We are representing the 95th Division or the 75th Guards Rifle Division of the Soviet Army. Uh, most of the uniforms you see are uh, the late war variety from 1943 on. Some of our men do have, uh, not currently present, do have the early war uniform on too. And uh, we have an encampment here as what you might have seen uh, near the front um, any time during uh, 1943 and 1944. We have a variety of weapons. We have our uh, SG-43 machine gun, which is uh, on our anti-aircraft mount. And if you were to uh, look behind me, you would see the Moussa Nagant, the infantry rifle. The uh, Pepe Shaw 41, what you Americans call a burp gun, which is our submachine gun. We also have a, a DP-28, which is our squad light machine gun. Um, we have a small mortar. We have a PTRS-41, which is our uh, anti-tank rifle, which fires a single solid projectile of 14.5 millimeter, which is big enough to penetrate the armor of most German tanks early in the war and rattle around in there wreaking mayhem and death upon the uh, crew. Uh, also you will see uh, a rangefinder, um, a field uh, telephone setup. Right here we have a period radio and we have our own Cyrillic typewriter. We're busy writing a letter to Stalin right now asking him to urge you Americans to open a second front. All right, you're, you're stalling on that. You're letting us uh, bleed ourselves white. So we're expecting you to invade Europe soon and help us out. We're fighting 80% of the German army. Did you Americans realize that? Yes, it's true. We're, we appreciate Lynn Lease. You sent us some very good stuff. We like the Studebaker trucks. We like the spam even. But uh, we need you to open a second front as soon as possible. So hurry up and invade Europe in the West. What else can I say? Dos vidanya! I will build my love a bower By a pure crystal fountain And on it I will pile All the flowers of the mountain Will ya go? Will ya 
here with my good friend Melissa Lincheski. Mm-hmm. Melissa, did you have fun this weekend? Oh, I had a great time. I mean, the, the crowds were excellent. The reenactor was yes. were fascinating. You saw me. We got to I hang out, out together. together. We, we danced. We, you know, you I, wore a beautiful dress last night at the dance. You. Did thank you like you. the music at the dance? Yes, yes. I mean, I like the historic dancing better than the modern stuff, but mm-hmm. it's great that we have both. So everybody can enjoy themselves and do exactly. everything. Exactly. Yeah. And with the modern music, they played a wide variety of pop music and, and oldies as well. So we had a good time. Yeah, yeah. We look forward to this every year. Yes, yes, yeah. We're already starting to plan for next year. So come back again to see what we do next year. Military History Fest 2016 is sadly coming to a close. This year, we saw some new and interesting exhibits, such as this here tank, the bomb shelter, and the Royal Air Force hut. We also saw some new and old friends in the vendor area. So please join us again next year for Military History Fest 2017. So I'm standing here with my buddy Dave Fresnel. Dave, do you have any parting words you'd like to say to our fans out there watching? Yeah, Uh, it's over with. Don't you people have homes, go home. It's over. Dave Fresnel.